Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about raising children in this modern and complex world. My guest today is Dr. Trishon Anderson. Dr. Trishon Anderson is an Assistant Professor of Child Development and Family Studies. Welcome Trishon and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thanks for having me, I'm really excited. Well let's, uh, with the first question, let's refer to what I said in the introduction about this modern and complex world that we live in today and we of course are still raising children as we always have throughout history. People today say it's a lot more challenging today to raise kids than it was 40 or 50 years ago because of all the distractions and all of again the complexity of technology and things of that nature. But is it really at its basic level any different in terms of raising kids? Um, you know, at its basic level, no, I don't think it's any different. Um, children go through the same things that they did 40 and 50 years ago. We still have colicky children. We still have terrible twos. We still have children that are finding their way in their socialization process. We still have adolescents looking for independence and identity. Um, so the things that children are going through, I don't think has changed very much in the past years. Um, but what I do think has changed is our environment. And so when we parent in a different environment, of course things will have to change as far as how we discipline, how we provide guidance for them, and how we um, entertain their independence, their growing independence. So has parenting changed? Not so much, but the environment has definitely changed, which then makes us change our parenting practices. And I guess the bottom line is kids are kids, kids will always be kids, mm -hmm. they're going to have the same issues growing up as you mentioned, yeah. but it's the external factors that we have to be concerned with. Exactly, that's what I believe. <laughs> okay, and as far as expectations for children today, it seems like we put a lot of uh, pressure on kids at a very early age <laughs> to grow up uh, quickly yeah. and we expect them to be able to read and write and to be smart and to be alert and to develop athletic ability in some cases or perhaps musical or performance talent in other cases right. and we expect this all before they get to kindergarten. <laughs> Are we putting too much pressure on the kids and should we just let them be kids? That's a good question. I'm a proponent of letting kids be kids. Um, you know, I feel like a lot happens just in the natural play of children. Um, they learn language, they learn cognitive development, they learn math, they learn socialization, and that's just in the form of play, and there's no real structured idea of what play is. Um, and so, you know, interestingly, in early childhood, we give children a range of development. So, for example, children aren't walking um, between the range of 10 to 15. 15 months, not saying their first words between 10 and 12 months. And so we give a range because children are going to develop in their own timing and um, when they're ready. And so when we force children to grow and develop, I feel like that's something that might inhibit them. But when we provide opportunity for them to grow and develop, then that helps influence um, where they where they take their development. And so, for example, um, you know, my son started walking at 10 months old. And that's really, you know, I don't really know why, but that's be, for when I think about in our environment, we just let them explore. We just let them walk around and crawl around and pull up on things and cruise around the furniture. And so when he had that opportunity, then his natural progression was then to go walk. And we're not bragging that he walked early, but it was just what we did in our environment. You know, my daughter is interested in writing her name in letters, but at the same time, we're not drilling her on letters and numbers. We have lots of books in our environment in which she is exposed to and so that then influences you know the natural progression to want to read and write after that um, and then you know systematically speaking when we look at the early childhood education system there is a push down and that's not something that's new there's a push down from the primary school system to where children are you know want needing to know their name um, recognize their name writing their letters and reading at a certain age and teachers early childhood teachers are feeling pressure from that and wanting to influence that in early childhood and so we've got curriculum like zoophonics in my daughter's classroom they're doing doing zoophonics where they're learning their letters, you know, and, and they're four, three and four years old where they're learning their letters. You know, um, I think the teachers do it developmentally appropriately. Um, that's not the case for all centers. So I do feel like there's a push from the primary school system to push academics down into the early childhood areas. So. What about the late bloomers though? In the old days, if kids weren't <laughs> picking it up quite as quickly, we'd say, well, that's just a late bloomer. What about yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think in early childhood, a late bloomer is going to be okay. That's why we provide ranges, you know, um, you know, on the whole walking example, my son walked at 10 months, my daughter walked at 14 months. So she was right at the cusp of that, you know, developmentally appropriate range. And so did we worry? Not so much. Did family worry? Of course, <laughs> um, wanting to go buy her things like that. But um, I feel like an early childhood, a late bloomer is not, um, is not an issue. Now, when they get into the public school system, the way the curriculum is set up from kindergarten, first and second, they have to know certain things and standards when they get there. And so when we're thinking about reading to learn and learning to read, well, they're reading to learn, they're learning to read in kindergarten, first and second grade, but by third grade, they're actually reading to learn. And so if they haven't caught up in that kindergarten through second grade time and they're into third grade and still can't read, well, then they're going to fall behind. So I do think late bloomers in later childhood or middle childhood is going to be a little more detrimental than in early childhood. Well, what about the relationships that parents develop with their children? Mm -hmm. There are some parents that want to be strict because they want to make sure the kids don't get out of hand. Mm -hmm. And there are other parents who want to have a lot of fun with their kids all the time and maybe want to be more like friends to their yeah. kids. You can go too far in either direction. So right. how do we strike the appropriate balance in terms of developing appropriate relationships with children so that they know that there's a sense of rules, but also that the parents can also enjoy time with them. Mm -hmm. I, what you've described is what we call in early childhood authoritative parenting. And authoritative parenting is going to be firm, but yet show some empathy and love. Um, going to have guided expectations, but still allow for autonomy and independence. And so it's really a great mixture of the two. Um, and I feel like that is going to be the best method of parenting um, outside of being too strict versus too lenient. because. We're put in this world as parents, in my opinion, to really lead and guide children. And so just think about a friend. A good friend is going to, you know, correct you when you're wrong, but also lift you up when you need some encouragement and what's right. And so if you want to be that friend person, then I feel like it needs to have a good balance of both. And what about discipline in terms of behavior with young children? At what point, at what age should we start to expect certain kinds of behavior that we would consider to be appropriate behavior or good behavior and can we establish some consistent um, sort of boundaries for behavior that can be applied uh, on a, on a regular basis? Yeah, you know, I think guidance starts really early. Um, you know, of course not in the newborn <laughs> stage and things of that nature, but um, I feel like guidance is the, is the foundation of discipline. So when we participate in guiding children into, um, you know, into activities, into learning their table manners. We're going through that now with my son who's eating table food now and he's at the table with the rest of us and we're telling him, you know, we, you don't drop your cup and, or if we do, we pick it up and we kind of redirect him um, or we go through, um, you know, teaching them signs like all done and all of that is a part of guidance and expectations so that when they do get to that age of understanding discipline, it's not a new concept for them because they've been guided and they learn the family rules and morals and values. So when it's time to actually set boundaries, it's not uncommon for them. So I feel like um, starting early, you know, with family expectations, what you expect of children in certain situations, you know, setting them up for success is going to be helpful so then when you actually have to discipline then it's not going to be something that they're going to take um, take and run with and not listen. Sure. <laughs> and the concept of timeout has been used a lot in the last 20 years or so. Is timeout effective? Are there other ways related to that that are better? Yeah, um, well, you know, in the early childhood setting, oftentimes we don't use timeout. It's more redirection. So if a child is having a hard time in an area of the classroom, we redirect them to a different area in which, you know, they can calm down. Maybe if they need to cry for a little bit or just, you know, need some quiet space, we redirect them to places in which they can do that. And, and I feel like that's going to be a better method instead of putting them in timeout and then maybe not explaining why they're in time, timeout or not having a, a certain time limit. I know some people say, you know, put them in timeout however many minutes, however their age there are, you put them in that many minutes. So if they're one in one minute, but 
You know, I wouldn't start that too early um, because children, I feel like, in order for effective discipline to occur, I feel like they need to understand, you know, what happened and why they're being reprimanded. And, and when we think developmentally, I don't think young children are ready for something like that. But, um, but it's kind of back to this whole guidance and setting expectations. I feel like that is the foundation of discipline. And what about the so-called corporal punishment, which involves spanking? That was very common yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah. Today, not nearly as common. In fact, a lot of people aren't doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. What does the research tell us about spanking? Is it effective or <laughs> does it have a negative yeah. long-term effect? Um, you know, in a research study that I just came across recently, it kind of analyzed about 80 studies um, that had looked at corporal punishment. And we're finding that it, it not that it's common, but 75% of parents are still using corporal punishment, you know, at least once until the age of 10, maybe. Um, and so it's not something that is, is uncommon, unfortunately. Um, what the research does say about corporal punishment is that it does lead to negative effects for children, um, especially in their behaviors, like antisocial behaviors, um, aggression, hostility, um, and internalizing and externalizing behaviors. So it does have some negative repercussions for children. Now, some research will state that, you know, it's different by certain ethnic groups, um, that in, in one ethnic group it doesn't make as much of a difference in, to another. But in my opinion, if it's wrong for one child, then it's wrong for any child. And so in my professional opinion, I would never advocate that as a form of punishment for parents because you never know how far parents are going to take things and we never know the impacts that it's going to have on children. So if we have found that it has negative impacts, then that's something that we shouldn't be resorting to. Okay, well, we just have about a minute before the break. Yeah, and in sure. that minute, I guess we can talk about the dichotomy of parents where you have one parent who's very strict and the other who is much more lenient. Mm -hmm. And you have two different styles, um, mother and father, but they have different uh, approaches. Uh, is that confusing for kids is, or is it actually a good thing for kids to experience that dichotomy because that's what the real world is going to be like? Um, and I agree with you. I feel like that's what the real world is, go real world is going to be like. And um, children will form attachments with caregivers in very different ways. And we found that fathers play differently than mothers play different than mothers play. And so when children have that dichotomy, they really experience two different forms of caregiving. What does need to be consistent, like I stated before, is that foundation. So their morals, values, goals for the family and goals for the children. I feel like when people are on one accord in that respect, then um, children are more comfortable in their environments. But the dichotomy of parenting, I don't think is that much of an issue. Okay, well on that note, we'll go ahead and go to the break, and when we come back from the break, we'll continue this conversation about raising children in a modern and complex world. Stay tuned. Get involved. Become a leader in the well-being of our nation, actively lending your voice and energy to promote wellness. Be the voice for public education and health education in schools, community organizations, hospitals, and clinics. You can become part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Dr. Trishon Anderson. Trishon, uh, when we went to the break, we were talking about uh, parenting styles and the dichotomy and so on. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to switch over to talking about when the kids are placed in daycare and preschool. How early can infants, I guess, be um, able to adjust to a new environment like a daycare or preschool or nanny for that matter? Mm -hmm. And what should parents be looking for when they're um, investigating preschools? I, I use the word investigating like it's almost a negative thing, yeah. but in terms of researching, we'll use that word, mm -hmm. when they're researching uh, a preschool or a daycare or a nanny, what should they be looking for? Yeah, well, you know, legally children can start school um, in a licensed childcare facility at six weeks, um, and that matches, that corresponds with our family leave. Um, so, the, and that's really young, but I have seen it. I've taken care of six weeks old myself. Um, and so some parents really don't like to go that young and will, you know, extend their time maybe to the 12 weeks for FMLA, whether it's paid or unpaid. Um, and so we'll wait until about 12 weeks to put their children into school, which rounds to about three months or so. Um, 
my idea of that is um, for me it's the earlier the better and and I and I caveat that with saying that it really depends on the quality of care that you're looking for and so what research has found and this is something that I research all the time is child care quality oftentimes is kind of low to mediocre when it comes to infant care and so I feel like parents do need to do some investigating or researching really great centers um, for their children and so what you're gonna look for is you know for me, it would be educated teachers and educated staff that has some training in infant toddler caregiving. Um, you know, whether the teachers are on the floor with the children and interacting, we really want really great inter teacher child interactions. We really want great access to materials and the children to have access to materials when they get ready to be mobile and things. Um, and so, and so if parents needed a timing in which they want children to go to school, I always say do so before six to seven months. Why? Because in development, there's what we call object permanence. And that's when children understand that something is still there, although it's gone, um, or they recognize that things are actually gone. And so, and that usually settles in around eight to nine months old. And so if that's the case, they're gonna understand that their parent is gone and may have a harder time separating. But if parents put their children in school before that piece of development settles in, well then they can leave and be in comfort with the caregiver and know that their child is going to be taken care of really, really well and not have a hard time adjusting. So that when they start school early and then they get into that stage of object permanence because it is gonna come back around, at least the child has adjusted to the caregiver into the setting so separation isn't going to be as hard so if I had to give an absolute number I would say sometime before six to seven months um, but then it really depends on the quality of care so um, so we're gonna be looking for high quality care and by quality I mean um, classroom quality and teacher quality as well okay so you put your child in preschool mm -hmm. and you're comfortable with the environment um, you like the teaching style, you like how the um, folks at the daycare center or the preschool interact with the children, mm -hmm. and then a report comes back home, your child is hyperactive, mm. or your child has attention <laughs> deficit disorder. Yeah. Um, are we over-diagnosing ADHD these days? Uh, it seems like we hear a lot about <laughs> it, and in the process of over-diagnosing, the next question is, what about the medication? Are we going overboard with medicating our kids at an early age? Yeah, you know, I, I do think that we are overdiagnosing. The good thing about early childhood is that we don't start diagnosing children at least until the age of three. That's almost the youngest that will diagnose for autism spectrum disorders and other things, unless there's a noticeable developmental delay or any kind of other disability that the child has. And so we kind of buy children a little bit of time in early childhood to really grow into themselves. Um, but then as they transition into primary school, yeah, they do get, you know, children that are hyperactive, um, you know, children that have a hard time attending to detail will then, you know, be succumbed to those kinds of diagnoses. And so my thought on that is that there's different types of learners out there. There's, you know, active learners. There's children that can sit for a good 30 minutes and attend to a lesson, but there's some children that can't. And what are we doing for those children that can't? We're expecting them to fall in line with the rest of the majority of the classroom. And so our teaching strategies aren't really changing with the needs of the child. And, and that's what I'm seeing is that, you know, their teachers are having trouble with classroom management because they're, they can't manage the child's behavior. So they send them off to the office and then the office goes and the school psychologist comes and she does her report and says, yes, your child has ADHD and this is what we can do to help. And so they provide them with medications and children will take these medications and it'll slow them down. And for me, you know, I'm not one to go for medications and things, and that's just my personal choice. But um, I feel like we need to learn how to live and we need to learn how to cope and manage with the things that we have. And so if we're constantly remedying things with an outside source, we're never really learning how to internally deal with our problems or, you know, our hyperactivity. And so, um, so I do think it's a problem in the school system. 
Are we seeing a difference between boys and girls at an early age in terms of which ones are much more hyperactive? Oh yeah, boys <laughs> get the bad end of the stick all the time. Boys are more hyperactive and, and they're the ones that are being more um, diagnosed at a, at a faster rate than girls are. And biologically speaking, you know, testosterone does have something to do with that. So when we look prenatally and we look, um, you know, when the fetuses, male fetuses are more active in the womb um, because of that spurt of T testosterone. Well, that spurt doesn't really go away when they come out of the womb. So they're out in the world with testosterone. They've got to get it out. They've got to be active. They want, I think there's a dichotomy between my son and my daughter. She was such a chill kid and we're like, oh, parenting is easy. And then we have my son and he's just into everything and it's wonderful to watch, but uh, there is a stark difference between the two. So um, not to say girls can't be active either because they are, but I think at a faster rate, boys are do get that end of the stick as being more hyperactive. Active. Where do we know how to draw the line in terms of medication at an early age or not? How, how long should we let this go before we resort to the pharmaceutical solution? And uh, how much of this is that we just need to let the boys be boys? Yeah, you know, I was just talking in a class about this the other day, and, and we were talking about obesity, really, but, um, but I was going to the point where we could use some policy changes, I feel like, in the, in the school setting. Um, you know, nowadays, children aren't getting the recess that I remember in school, we had about three or four recesses. It was morning, and then a break, and then the lunch, and then after school, and we had time to get outside and run around and get that excess energy out, and nowadays, children are given and, you know, maybe a half hour if they can scarf down their lunch fast enough. And so they're not getting a lot of time outside to get that extra energy out. And so, you know, I feel like if we remedy these things first by making some structural changes to the policies, you know, how often children can go outside. If we help teachers, you know, learn about different strategies of instruction, so music and movement and adding things into the curriculum, um, then I feel like we can start there. And then if children really have of, you know the disorder or they really need some more assistance then we can resort to those things but I'm always a, I'm a problem solver I try to figure things out first before we resort to medication and I think this leads nicely into the next question <laughs> which is uh, about the imagination playground you've been involved in work and yeah. study about the so-called imagination playground what is that? So with Dr. Jim Elliker at Purdue, we did a research study with the Imagination Playground and what they are, these huge life-size blocks, almost the length of this, well, half the length of this table. Um, and they're all different shapes and sizes. We got blocks and squares and cylinders and arcs and tracks. Um, and, and they're really foam, foam and dense and light enough for children to still manipulate them. And so we did a research study looking at how children play with these loose parts. That's what it's called is loose parts play. Um, how children play with these loose parts versus traditional playground structures, you know, like the slides and jungle gym, and then how they play inside of the classroom, looking at the dramatic play area. And what, we're what we did find is that children do more physical activity with these huge blocks than they did on the traditional playgrounds, which was excellent for teachers in the Midwest who can't get outside to play all the time. They can use the, um, the blocks as a, a substitute. And so what I loved about the project that has really allowed children their creativity because there's no curriculum involved in Imagination Playground. They just got to play and explore and put pieces together and see what fits. And we, and we even had a component of engineering with there, which really met the needs of this whole STEM era that we're going with. And so we found children were exhibiting um, engineering behaviors along with gross motor and physical, um, so, and, and along with creativity and, and social play as well, so. So I guess a cold, cold weather environment <laughs> is no excuse for not letting the kids play and, and yeah. become creative. Right. And uh, that leads to the next question, mm -hmm. which is, what creates a really healthy and happy and caring environment for children? First and foremost, I think it's consistent caregiving. Um, you know, when children know that they can rely and count on a caregiver to take care of their needs, their most basic needs, and that someone is going to be there that has an interest in them and that is going to facilitate their development, I feel like that is the the greatest foundation um, in an environment children can have. Of course, safety is involved as well. Um, for parents, I think it's fair parenting. That's what we call it in our household, where we're fair. You know, we, we provide some independence, but when it's time to listen and pay attention, you know, that's what we need to do for the safety of our children. So some fair parenting, 
Um, I think in a place where children can be kids and actively explore, so people are all worried about, you know, um, creating their house to be a safety zone, you know, putting plugs and, and poisons away and, and things of that nature. So we definitely need a safe environment for children can explore. Some people call it a no-no zone. So like where you're not saying no all the time, but you're letting children explore in their own free will. Um, um, but that's a big question, and I feel like those are maybe the three most important: is a safe environment, good teacher, good interactions, you know, fair parenting, and then a really great foundation of trust for young children. Okay, well, let's go back to the first question okay. when we talked about the complexity of society with all of the technology that's available to us today. Yeah, is technology um, overstimulating our kids at an early age? <coughs> Or on the other hand, um, is it good to have um, electronic accessibility because it can help in terms of stimulating children in, in good ways? Right, um, so the American Pediatric Association will say children under two years old should not have any screen time, access to screen time. And then thereafter, it needs to be monitored and you know the amount of time and content needs to be monitored as well. Um, so, you know, but that's the society we live in. There's nothing we can do about that. As much as I don't want my son and my daughter to play with my phone, well, I have it in my hands all the time. I try to be aware of that, but sometimes it doesn't work. And so they're exposed to it. And and even now in schools, they, they get iPads. You know, they go home and take their homework, you know, home on an iPad. So they're exposed to it. So we want our children to be progressive in knowing, you know, how to use technology. But I think what needs to be monitored is definitely the content for one. Um, it should be age appropriate, educational, if it can be um, kind of slow paced, especially for early childhood, but also the amount of time needs to be on it. And so, um, you know, cutting the TV off, you know, maybe an hour before bedtime is going to help children sleep better. Um, research has shown that some children, you know, have attention, um, not disorders, but have uh, problems with their attentions with repeated and excessive use of technology. So we have found some negative things as far as child development is concerned, but, but technology is not something that we can just do away with. So I think we need to set some limits with that. And unfortunately, technology and time is running against us now. We're going to have to yeah. bring this to a close. Sure. But I want to thank you for being with us and sharing these concepts today. Yeah, no problem. It was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon when we'll discuss another interesting topic. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.